Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really happy to have with me once again David Jensen. Uh, we speak with David almost every week to help us uh, get a handle on what's actually happening in the metals markets and how they sort of, um, well, how they, the activities in the metals markets uh, intervene or intertwined with the uh, geopolitics that we talked to Daniel McAdams about. So uh, it's uh, welcome, David. It's good to have you back again. Good morning, Jay. My pleasure. Always good to talk to you. We I like to start out, uh, because this show has so much to do with the gold markets, the GOFO rate and then some of the other metals. The GOFO rate, uh, where, where does that stand this week? It's approximately the same as last week. It's, uh, we could say it's flat, but it's uh, in the 0.1% to 0.12% uh, for the one to three month interval. So no real action there um, in terms of uh, the relationship of the, the price of leasing gold. Um, versus borrowing U.S. dollars, so they're they're roughly equivalent for for our purposes of discussion. But that's not true of some of the other metals, which are in much uh, greater shortage of supply. Starting with silver, uh, you have the Shanghai Premia that is um, 3.6 percent or or 75 cents. Yeah. Uh, what can you tell us about that and some of the other precious metals that are? Yeah, well, this this starts to track the decline in the um, the silver stocks that we've seen in in Shanghai over the last eighteen months. So it's uh, you know that premium has been as high as six and a half percent, and it's tracking about three point six percent now, and and that's on the Shanghai Gold Exchange, and on the Shanghai Metal Exchange, um, you know we're seeing platinum with a, a eighty five dollar or five point seven percent premium to the. New York and London prices and and palladium also um, tracked on the Shanghai Metal Exchange at about one hundred and thirty four dollars an ounce or fifteen point two percent. So, you know, I, I guess the the, the, the key is uh, with these numbers is that these are these are metal prices and they are the premium for the metal um, versus the derivative uh, or digital prices that we see trading in in New York and London. Exactly, but it seems to me, David, that uh, you know any enterprising treasurer of, of a platinum or palladium producing company would uh, take advantage. This is sort of an arbitrage situation. It would, it would seem it would cost some money, of course, to, to send your metals overseas into Shanghai or wherever else you would have, wherever these markets exist. But why wouldn't, uh, why wouldn't that happen and make this, make this, num- make this uh, disparity disappear? Well, it, sh- it, it, it should. I mean, with the mining companies, uh, you know, they're typically uh, tied into longer-term contracts. Sure. But, you know, change yeah. comes slowly. Yeah. And I, I know even in the metals community that so many uh, commentators in the metals community, you know, they're tracking the Kitco price on the daily basis yeah. and talking about breakout patterns and things. But there's more information if you cast farther afield. And um, I think that this is uh, th- this is a flashing light that's just uh, it won't go out, and it's telling us um, that there is a very substantial premium to be had um, in that market for physical metal. And uh, I think all we can do is uh, you know see or look for the signs of the gradual change. But I would expect that shortages there would spread to shortages here. Um, you know, there's a I checked the numbers on the Chinese auto market, and there are over 18 million cars a year. That are being delivered there, so they surpass even the United States. Mm-hmm. And um, you know the cost of palladium, uh, you know, a, a catalytic converters is, is roughly about four hundred dollars per catalytic converter. So even if the price doubles, we're at eight hundred dollars a catalytic converter, and uh, it's not enough to materially impact the production of these vehicles. So I, I think that that premium is going to exist. Um, until the demand is met, and uh, we're not seeing it. And the thing that I find really surprising is that all three of these metals, silver, platinum, and palladium, um, are not responding on the New uh, York-London markets. And and perhaps that's just the way it's going to be, that we're going to have the new physical markets parting ways. uh, Mm -hmm. And then the market actually starting to track the physical markets because that's the true market. Um, You know, old habits die hard. Yeah, um, but uh, I think that the markets are going to realize that there's something else going on on these on these other platforms and start to track the meaning of those prices because that's ultimately what markets are about is supply and demand and price. Sure, I mean uh, you would think that with that disparity, people that are on the buy side of these metals would be going to the paper markets and uh, trying to buy it cheaper. 
and then taking a delivery perhaps which would force the price up or into equilibrium with the physical markets. You would think that would take place over time as well. But on the other hand, as you and I have talked about in the past, you have these large bullion banks that can come in with unlimited uh, supplies, uh, unlimited uh, financial resources to go out and, uh, you know, and, and buy um, uh, and short the market essentially in the futures market and drive the price lower. So it's, I guess it's, you know, it's, it's just the way it is. Uh, there's that unlimited phony market, virtual market, yeah, the, as you talk about. Yeah, they're not bringing additional metal to meet the demand. That's that's the bottom. Um, that's the bottom line. And and you know, we've talked about it several times now. And I think that this is something we'll just keep tracking and uh, see where it goes. But it yeah. is a. It is definitely. It merits attention. Yeah. Eventually, you would think that uh, the markets would have to would have to um, find an equilibrium point there and there, the disparity would disappear. Well, one of the biggest news items last week, in my view, aside from the horrible uh, crash, uh, airline, uh, the Malaysian airline plane that went down, was also the news about the BRICS. Uh, yeah. They sort of formalized what they've been talking about. We've seen this coming for some time, but a $50 billion new development bank and $100 billion for a contingency pool. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that, Dave? Um, the, the BRICS appear to be setting up uh, uh, devices and control systems for an alternative uh, financial system. And um, I guess there's really two things. One is the whole uh, concept of, of fairness, which um, the, the BRICS countries have been complaining about in, in terms of the, the IMF. Uh, you know, you look at the voting uh, structure of the IMF and the, and the U.S., U.K., Germany, France, and Japan those five countries have about uh, 10% of the world's population, but they have 40% of the votes. Mm -hmm. And in 2010, it was promised that they were going to reform this voting structure. Right. And there's been no reform, uh, I guess, because it suits uh, those countries uh, just fine. Um, uh, but I think the other issue, too, is that uh, our financial system, uh, which has been converted from a a market-based system to a, a, a digital virtual system uh, over the last, uh, let's say, 50 years especially, um, is extraordinarily unstable. And it's time for modification, There's, it's time for adaption, and it's time for reform. And the West does not seem to be willing uh, to engage in this reform. Um, you know, this this morning, you know, there's a Russia Today article that was out with uh, Dr. Rosalind Fuller, and she mm -hmm. was comment, commenting in it, and I thought her her, uh, her comments were, were very succinctly put, and she talked about a history professor who commented about Euro the European Revolution in the 1850s uh, occurred because, uh, you know, the, the Europe encountered a turning point where Europe failed to turn. Mm-hmm. And that really resonated with me, and I see a very similar situation today, both because of the unsustainability of our current uh, virtual market system, uh, as well as the, the un, uh, unfairness of the control by the West, while the, uh, you know, there's much more productivity and creation of wealth coming out of the East now mm -hmm. than there has been before. And, and they would like a greater role and, and a greater voice, and they're not getting it. So yeah. I really see that the BRICS are, are breaking away from a, a very similar uh, type of a unsustainable rigged system, um, you know, very similar to the unsustainability of the, of the royalty-based system in Europe in the 1850s. Uh, well, and certainly, uh, w given the level of globalization that has taken place over the last number of years, the, inter, uh, the trading with, uh, with various countries, uh, you know, the, the sort of... Um, pushing Putin into a corner or, or, or forcing him into the arms of, uh, of China or working with China, the BRICS nation. I mean, the trade is being disrupted already to a great extent, and uh, it just seems to me that maybe the West doesn't realize uh, to what extent it's, it's going to have some problems ahead if we, if we don't uh, face the turning point, the, the limits to our extravagance, if, if you will. But, you know, uh, this extravagance that we have engaged in in the West for so many years is really, I believe, and I think you believe as well, David, that it's caused by uh, this monetary system that we have that has really broken down. It's really a, a debased, uh, corrupt uh, monetary system. Um, you know, but 
it seems to me, though, that you know the, the, the politicians are trying to make it look like they're really concerned about our monetary mm. system. And you have this U.K. Uh, serious fraud office, it's called, starting a criminal probe of foreign exchange trading and traders. Uh, it, uh, it, it seems to me a little bit superficial. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, both that announcement of the uh, uh, of the serious fraud office uh, probe into foreign exchange trading and, and traders. I mean, that when you look at the at the at the commodities markets and what's been going on there for the longest time, I mean, that's where the action is. And so, you know, that uh, as well as you know the West's response overall, um, you know, certainly NATO countries have been creating chaos throughout the Middle East and. And uh, when you dig into what went on in, in Libya and, and Egypt and uh, Syria, um, the financing of ISIS and, or, or ISIL and the uh, disruption of, of Iraq now, mm-hmm. um, the funding coming from you know, the UK and, and uh, uh, the United States and, and, and Israel and Saudi Arabia. I mean, it's, you know, we are, we are not dealing with the issues. We are, we are uh, creating other stories and other distractions. And, you know, if we want to get really to the heart of it all, if the serious fraud office wanted to look at you know, price rigging and, and, and market disruption, they should really be digging into the structure of the trading instruments, which are traded in, in the LBMA, the gold price, the way it is set. Mm-hmm. Um, but they won't do that because uh, the system is comfortable for those who are, are there right now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they, they don't want to deal with the uh, implications of um, that we need higher interest rates. And, and the, the linkage of, of gold ver- and, in- and uh, interest rates goes back. Uh, Larry Summers, who the former Treasury Secretary, wrote a paper about that, about Gibson's paradox, as it is turned. And the relationship that, uh, you know, rising gold prices uh, give you higher interest rates. Yeah. And the West doesn't want to uh, face up to higher interest rates. They're convincing, convincing people that we need lower interest rates and that we uh, need to continue to distort the economy with, with cheap money as, as an out, as a solution to the malstruction of the economy, which has arisen from the low um, interest rates to begin with. But, I mean, to understand Gibson's paradox is really at the, at the center of all this. Um, and I, I think, um, yeah, if I can give you a quick summary, Jay, um, uh, Gibson's paradox relates to the fact that uh, interest rates uh, over several hundred years were found to rise not with consumer goods prices, but uh, were, were found to be forced up by a rising gold price. Mm-hmm. And so if you want to visualize it in kind of uh, you know, tangible terms, um, you know, as the price of gold is rising, uh, usually due to debasement of currency or printing of money, uh, the interest rate that you give on the money has to be increased to draw investors out of gold and back into uh, paper instruments, and right. into, bo- into bonds. Mm-hmm. So well, it, it, in that context, it makes sense that uh, you know if you want to force interest rates down, or if, uh, you force the price of gold down and you right. say, oh, look, there's no inflation. Um, right. Everything must be properly priced and and we're now in this, uh, what do they call it, the great moderation is what the Wall Street Journal explained uh, to its readers as to why uh, gold and inflation had suddenly died in the 90s. Not the fact that they were uh, trading unallocated gold and using derivatives to manipulate the gold price. Yeah. Well, yeah, so the, so the need then to, uh, to keep the gold price down so people don't start to question the viability of paper money, right? Yeah, well, we need to reform the money system. We need a write-down in bonds to create a sustainable level of debt away from the 300% plus of, of global GDP that we're seeing now. It's a, it's a multi-hundred trillion dollar market out there, and, and they need to, uh, to reform. Um, but the people who are at the center of this and the banking interests who are at the center of this, uh, you know, have been at it since really the late 80s. And they really don't appear to to want to modify things because it has been so lucrative uh, to them so far. Yeah, interesting how um, you know the regulations that were in place before sort of um, gave way. They were they were taken away in 1991. The CFTC, uh, starting with Goldman Sachs, gave financial institutions the right to speculate in commodities they did not possess. Yeah. I mean, this is at the heart of what you're talking about. You and I talk about every every week almost here about how yeah. the virtual markets, right. these uh, financial institutions can go in and, and on both sides of the market and, and basically control 
the virtual market price of these commodities. Um, right. So, we're, how, again, we get to this level, this idea of limits, and Europe not turning in the 1800s. They, the, the turning point where Europe failed to turn. We're we're at that point. We need to turn. We need to get back to allow the markets to work. But we're not doing it because the people in charge love to have it the way it is because they keep getting richer and more powerful. But some point, David, as you, an engineer, know, there are limits. Uh, when the limits are met, or try, or when you try to exceed those limits, the system breaks down. So, yes. how soon? Well, I mean, it's been going on since the early '80s, and um, it, it, I think we must be getting close. When you start to see, uh, you know, the, the, the physical price of metal breaking away from these paper markets. Um, uh, when you start to see war creation, war manufacture, and it's, it's, it's a very difficult, uh, awkward thing for me to face too because I've always been such a strong believer in the, in the Western system and what I thought was a market-based system. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I still believe very strongly in markets, but I realize how it's been uh, really diverted from its uh, intent. Um, but it's we must be close. It's, it's, um, but it has been a very, very long path, and, and we see... Uh, basically, the intervention into the markets and and uh, you know the the right was being given by the CFTC to Goldman Sachs and these these banking uh, companies who make money from uh, speculation in the financial uh, markets, their right to reach into these markets and and really, Jay, I want to touch on the fact that the CFTC it gave it gave permission to to uh, J. Aaron and Son, which is a division of Goldman Sachs. Mm-hmm. And, and by the way, the CEO, uh, Lloyd Blankfein of Goldman Sachs, currently came from J. Aaron and Son. He was a gold trader of all things. Mm. So talk about a guy who understands well what is going on. Yeah. When we see this, the CFTC giving permission to Goldman Sachs in 1991 to speculate um, in derivatives, and then the Agriculture Commission in the States was not even told about this permission, and the Agriculture Commission finding out about it uh, in 1997 and going back to ask for, to the CFTC for details and then being told by the CFTC, um, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, um, that the Agriculture Commission could only see the letter to Goldman Sachs giving them permission if Goldman Sachs agreed. Oh, my goodness. You know, that tells us, that tells us who is in control here. I mean, Absolutely. The, the regulator, the notional regulators... Uh, are really just a front to make everybody comfortable that things are under control, but they appear to have been controlled, and this intervention in the market seems to have been controlled uh, by the banks at the center of the system. So we need to return to real markets. We re- need to real- return to real prices uh, and real interest rates. And it appears to me that there is an unwillingness uh, by government and, and by the banking industry who both benefit from creation of endless money um, but I think that in the end, that it's it's uh, the unwillingness now and going through this turning point uh, and failing to turn is going to create chaos here in the West. And, and the distraction, distracting everybody with war creation and crisis creation, um, you know, in this age of the Internet is not as effective a tool, certainly, as it was before. And, and they may not be successful at it. Yeah. Well, they say the first casualty uh, of war is truth. It seems to me that, uh, you know, in addition to the things that are going on in the Ukraine, we just talked to Daniel McAdams about that, and certainly uh, Ron Paul put out a piece uh, talking about all the questions uh, that will not be asked and addressed by the Western media. Uh, certainly, the, the as, as the saying goes, and I believe it's very true, the first casualty of war is truth. That mm-hmm. is also true. We have a war going on in the financial markets. And it just seems to me, David, that the American public, um, are, are just just absolutely uninformed about what is really taking place. And, of course, that's what we try to do on this show as much as possible. There's a lot of other shows on the Internet, too, that uh, that try to, to, to find out what's really going on. You know, it's a very interesting, as it was pointed out um, uh, by Paul Craig Roberts, that the, that the true journalists of these days, uh, guys like Greenwald and um, and Julian Assange, who's holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, that just shows the extreme price it's paid for going after the truth and looking for questions and questioning the media. How can it be that everybody sees everything alike when you have you know millions of people that just sort of somebody once said that um, uh, if everybody thinks alike, then nobody is thinking. 
-hmm. it seems to me that applies very much to what's going on uh, <laughs> in the true. West right now. I don't know any anything else, David. You you would like to mention this week? Well, I, I see the the old war horses, or you know, the old political horses, uh, like Hillary Clinton and John McCain, and they're they're calling for war with Russia and conflict yeah. with Russia. And, uh, you know, humanity marches on. Um, the markets march on, and, and the markets are an expression of humanity trying to find um, the right way to operate and exist uh, as effectively as we can, so that you know we bring maximum benefit to people. And um, unfortunately, these uh, systems, which have been created for the benefit of all, have been really seized and controlled by a very uh, a small uh, group of interests for for many decades and, and now we look back and we see centuries of manipulation um, and I think that we're getting to the point now in terms of the, the consciousness of, of humanity is starting to wake up. Um, people are looking around and asking questions, pertinent and important questions and uh, increasingly they're, they're, they're unwilling to take the old, uh, you know, the old opiates themselves that they've taken before and and, and so I, I think that these politicians who operate by the old rules are going to fail. And uh, we're going to go through a very strong corrective period, which is going to be very unpleasant. Um, but I think that uh, good things ultimately will come at it as long as we um, survive some of the greater threats to humanity, uh, such as um, nuclear power and nuclear weapons and all these things, which can all be thrown into the mix, uh, you know, during times of upheaval. So it's yeah. just a... It's a corrective phase from a from a unsustainable period, and I think that people really have to keep their eye on the ball. And I really suggest keep your eye on the metals markets, keep your eye on real metals prices, mm -hmm. uh, watch interest rates responding because um, ultimately the markets are going to start to move um, in the in the direction. And we really, really uh, have to have reform and have it now. And I really encourage people to speak to those. Um, who can influence uh, policy and to try to push uh, for this uh, reform because we, we have a very short period where we can implement it and we have to go around the, the, the parties in power and, and the parties who have benefited to now from a, a manipulated system. Oh, I agree with all of that for sure and uh, truth of course is what we want to, to focus on as you say and, and the truth teller uh, you know, it's a little bit like turning the lights on when the burglar is approaching your house at night. They don't like that very much. And Greenspan understood very well that the truth teller in the markets was gold and how important gold was. Uh, and again, it gets to this Gibson's paradox uh, connection that you mentioned, I think, David, is that, yeah. you know, when, when the gold price starts to rise dramatically, people start to have doubts about, uh, you know, about the system. And yeah. frankly, uh, the listeners on this show, uh, since times have the good times have returned, as the mainstream would have us believe, uh, the, our numbers have gone down very dramatically. We started this show in March of 2009. It was sort of at the bottom of the uh, of the Lehman Brothers debacle, and immediately the show was a great success, and mm -hmm. our numbers kept growing and growing. And now I think that uh, the numbers are down because people are more complacent and they think that. Uh, things are going to be all right. Well, this, uh, of course, exactly at these times when the best opportunities uh, are sometimes available in terms of investing. And But most, more than that, as you say, what we want to do is try to keep our eye on the ball, understand what's going on so we can protect our families and our loved ones. We start with that. Uh, but knowing what's going on, I think, is always better than not. So uh, thank you very much, David, once again, for helping us um, see some of the things that are really going on as opposed to uh, the... Uh, the propaganda that we're being fed day in and day out. Thank you very much for being with us again. Thank you. It's my pleasure, Jay. 